Our text is not going to come completely from 2 Corinthians 11, but I just want to point out something as a way of introduction from 2 Corinthians 11 that would set the, the foundation of, of the sermon. Uh, we live in a Christianity today that is like a smorgasbord. You know, we have uh, different kinds of Christians, professing Christians, uh, r- r- uh, with different kind of beliefs, especially um, things that pertain to salvation. And it has to do with uh, false teachers creeping in to the church uh, as a whole. Uh, We have uh, on YouTube and other places and platforms different uh, ones promoting Christianity and they all do it for different reasons. But while they do that, they, you know, corrupt Christendom. And so there are people that no doubt carry a whole heap set of beliefs with them and their beliefs kind of hinder their walk. What you believe in uh, no doubt naturally will uh, flow out to your view of God and your walk with God. And over here in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 the Apostle Paul says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled or deceived Eve through his subtlety so your minds shall be corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul was concerned for the Corinthians. They would not fall victim like Eve to the satanic lies that have corrupted and confused their mind from the very simple gospel or those things that pertain to Christ. He says in verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, Him we have not preached, or you receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted. He says, you might well bear with him, you put up with it. So this doesn't tell us that there is another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. It just tells us there's a counterfeit, and that the devil's always trying to counterfeit that which is good, and uh, promote Christendom in such a way that is distorted. The concept of salvation is not difficult to understand. Uh, The whole gospel is not difficult to understand. As a matter of fact, it's simple. However, Christendom has complicated it because of the false teachers that creep in and continue to distort the truths of God's word. We have, you know, a gospel that teaches that you're saved by grace and works, uh, which is a lie of the devil. No man can save themselves. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. And then we have a Christendom that says, yeah, it's all of grace. And that salvation is perhaps like that cheap that it doesn't do anything to your life, doesn't change your life. As a matter of fact, you know, you come to Christ and nothing really changes. And that's okay. They won't challenge you on that aspect as long as you just believe. You know, isn't it just by faith? But my question is, what kind of faith is that? And so Christianity has been thrashed, abused, corrupted, by human workers of Satan among God's people. And so verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That's how serious it is. That Satan will stoop so low to creep in, you know, um, with a mask making himself to be something that is not through human resources and human uh, workers of iniquity and deceitful workers that only promote themselves and not Christ. People are gullible and naive like Eve was. Even in the churches of God today, they accept everything and anything that calls themselves Christian and they don't examine or test or prove And there's a reason for that. So I want to simply help you understand what are, you know, the true marks of a Christian. I want to point to two today. Uh, When we look into the Word of God, we notice four classes of people that God addresses. The first one are believers, of course. So most of the epistles are written to believers. How to conduct yourself as a believer, how to act as a believer, live your life as a believer. A believer is someone who has genuinely with all their heart, with all sincerity, put their faith in Jesus Christ and they become a true Christian. There's marks or there's 
fruit in their life to prove their faith. And a true believer is someone that is devoted and has a relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, they have a devoted relationship with Christ. They have a personal, devoted relationship with Jesus Christ. A non-believer is someone that is obviously a non-Christian, and it is an antichrist. Someone that knows the truth and rejects the truth. They don't want to know the truth. They're heathens. They're professed heathens. They're not even sitting on the fence. This is non-believers. They don't believe. They don't want to believe. Um, they've made their decision. And this person has uh, you know, a devil-like relationship with God. Uh, you know, Jesus said to the Pharisees that didn't want anything to do with him. He says this to him. He says, you are your ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, because there was no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself, for he's a liar and the father of it. And he says to the Pharisees, you're just like the devil. He's a you, don't, you don't care for the truth. You don't want to know the truth. You're governed by lies. And uh, that just, uh, they have a devil-like faith concerning the things of God. And then thirdly, we have backsliding believers. These are Christians, these are believers, but somehow in their walk, they have gone on a little slippery dip. They've gone wayward. There's reasons for that. Uh, I believe in backsliding Christians. Um, I believe in the chastening hand of God when, when, when Christians backslide to bring them back into that place where God wants them to be. But this is someone that perhaps is living uh, a carnal life. They know the truth. They, they would never you know, in, in their life, deny uh, or betray, I should say, Christ. They might deny him, but they won't betray him like Judas did. But they're just backslidden. They're living in sin. They haven't recovered. And we have Christians like that. So this backsliding Christian has perhaps like a distorted relationship with God until he recovers. And then we have what we call, or what I would say I would call the most common today is a professing Christian. And a professing Christian is a false believer a false believer it's someone that claims they have trusted Jesus Christ as their savior but do not demonstrate any fruit of the new man they have no desire to prove their faith in other words uh, you know uh, they're just mimicking uh, the Christian life but there's no life in them uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 the Bible says not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. I believe one of the marks of a true Christian is someone that has a great desire to do the will of God. And the will of God is first and foremost believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the will of God that every single one of us comes to Christ and follows Christ. And, uh, and by the way, let me just say this to you. The name Christian and Christianity is, you know, very overrated today when someone comes to christ they're a christian meaning they're a follower of jesus christ they haven't come to join a denomination there are people that will convert from islam to christianity but they have no fruits of salvation they have changed one religion to another religion but they have no relationship with jesus christ and so we have to understand that christianity is not a denomination it's not a religion as we see it today Christianity is when a person makes a decision to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. To follow the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart. To love him with all their heart. It's not just accepting the fundamentals of the faith. It's not embracing the religious system and forgetting about the Savior. And not having a walk with God. There's a lot of professing Christians that can tell you this statement of faith verbatim. And they would believe it. As a matter of fact, they'll even contend. But they have no life in them they have no relationship with god they're dead there's a reason for that too i want to point out the two marks or two major marks of a person who truly possesses salvation first of all the call of the sinner there must be a conviction of sin in your life the day you've called on christ listen and the day you continue to walk with god that conviction of sin for the saved person, not only on the point of salvation, but throughout his walk with God, is always there. It never fades away. That, that conviction that God gives before someone can ever honestly be truly saved by the blood of Christ or come to Christ, they have to come under deep conviction of their sin. 
They must. Uh, by the way, this eliminates the, the notion of someone say, you know, saying that I was born a Christian. No, we, we're not born Christians, we're born sinners. Amen? Uh, we're, we're not born Christians. We might be brought up in a Christian home, which is fine, but we're not born you know, uh, having this desire to follow God or follow Jesus Christ. <clears throat> One thing that hinders a person from having a deep conviction uh, you know, of sin is self-righteousness or self-justification. People normally will compare themselves with a pedophile or someone that is a murderer and justify themselves that way. And, you know, this is no doubt hinders them from really seeing their sin in the light of God's word. It really hinders them from really seeing their sin in the light of God's law. When you compare yourself to your next door neighbor, you're doing good. But when you start comparing yourself by the standard of God's word and you look in the mirror of God's holy word, you'll start to realize you're not that good. As a matter of fact, you'll come from good to worse. You realize I am wicked. I am, I am. That's why we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know, a wretch is someone that is wicked, someone that is absolutely depraved, but they see their depravity. They see their condition for what it really is. The Holy Spirit of God's role is to show you your sin through, the God, through God's word. But a lot of people cannot see their sin is because they're, they're so self-righteous and they're justifying themselves. I want you to turn to Luke 18. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. But notice what the Bible says in Luke 18 verse 9. Jesus gives a parable, a classic example. When he tells this parable between the publican and the Pharisee and the difference between the two. Okay, I want you to see Luke 18 verse 9, he spoke this parable unto a certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, adulterers, or even as this publican, this scumbag. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes under heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a what? Sinner. Can I just say this to you? That this attitude of this publican continues on in the Christian life. No matter how far you grow as a Christian, you could never boast in the things that God has done in your life. You can only give God the glory and say, look what God has done in my life. You would never come to the point where you despise others. Because you know, if when you see others you can only, that are sinful, you can only see them in need of a saviour because you sat where they once sat. You can't judge them. You can only say they need Christ. They need the Lord. When you get to that point where you're despising others and you lift yourself up and you put people down and uh, you, you compare yourselves. A lot of people like to compare themselves today with the scum of the world today. Now, I know there are people that do, you know, things that are disgusting and, and depraved attitudes and, and exhibit some dreadful things. But you know what? If it weren't for the grace of God, we would just be, if not as bad, you know, would be, forget about it. We'd be finished. You know, the human nature is terrible. You know, God has given our conscience as a bell that rings, even though we have a human nature. And if you respond to that conscience and it's still active and living, you have a better chance in coming to Christ than those that have seared their conscience. And I understand that. And they've, they're depraved. They, they, they do things that are unthinkable. And I get that. I understand that. But listen to me very carefully. That doesn't excuse you from your sin. Because you, in the light of God's word and the holy God, have fallen short. And you've got to see yourself how God sees you. Notice what he says here in verse 14. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house. Look at this. Look at this word. Justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be what? Exalted. If you can just admit that you are wretched and wicked 
and sinful before God. Like I'm talking about really broken and sinful and see your sin. By the way, when you get older in the faith, that doesn't go away. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep saying that. It actually, the more you see yourself in the, in, uh, uh, you know, in, in the light of God's character and the closer you get to him, the more you see how much work needs to be done. You say, well, man, he's he, 18 years, Charlie. Hasn't he done a great work in you? Yeah, absolutely. But if you're getting closer to God and you're seeing him holy for he is, separate from sinners, we're nothing like him. And we want to, you know, you know, uh, can I say, immolate him. We want to be uh, looking to him and to be like him. The Apostle Paul said, I haven't apprehended. I haven't come to that point where I've arrived. There's a, a lot of work to be done this side of heaven. And that doesn't go away, but it starts at salvation. Lord, I am not what you want me to be. You have made me and I've fallen short. I have sinned. And when, no doubt we have sinned against the holy God. Look, there must be a true conviction of sin. When someone starts justifying their sin or undermining their sin, they cannot confess the Savior. And it's true essence. All right, and that's the second one. There must be a true confession of the Savior. You know, religion pe religious people have trouble seeing their sinfulness. Have a look at John chapter 9, verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I am coming to this world, that they would see not might see and they which see might be made blind and some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him are we blind also and Jesus said to them in verse 41 if ye were blind you should have no sin but now you say we see therefore your what remains your sin they're not admitting that they're blind and that we need God to open up our eyes they're saying well are we are we Blind also? Yeah, you just, you're just as blind as the blind man. But because you can't admit that, your sin remains. See, there's no salvation for those that cannot really admit their blindness or their wretchedness or realize that they're lost without God. They're condemned without God. There's got to be that deep conviction of sin before you can actually confess the Savior. Religion blinds the eyes of a person to see their need for Christ. As a matter of fact, spiritual maturity blinds the eyes of a Christian to see that they need to continue to grow. Did you know that? Christians, when you grow as a Christian, don't be content where you are. Say, God, I want you to continue to develop me and make me into the image of Christ. We need to grow, brethren. You know, if we go from, you know, from where we were to where we are, we thank God for it and we say, God, do more. Yeah. But how can you do more when we're not broken, when we when we don't do the things that we know we should do. It's not only, you know, sin is not only doing those things that we shouldn't do. Sin is also, you know, not doing those things that we should do. That's what James says. To him to know to do good and do with it not, to him is sin. There are some things as a Christian God wants us to do. And if we don't do it, that's sin. And so God help us understand that it doesn't have to be just gross sin in our lives, but it can be blunt rebellion against God. Having a deep conviction of sin leads a person to a savior. Peter saw his sinfulness. Peter said in Luke 5 verse 8, he fell down on his knees and he said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. This was the beginning when God called Peter to become a disciple. Peter, right from get-go, did not undermine his sin. He saw it. He saw it. The prodigal son eventually saw his sinfulness. Luke 15, 18, he says, I will arise and go to my father and I will say to my, uh, him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now, what, is sin, what are we being saved from? I understand when someone's get, someone is being saved or you know, they call on the Lord to be saved, what are we being saved from? Whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Saved. What are we being saved from? Sin. Jesus died for our Sin, Matthew chapter 1, for a saviour, his name shall be called Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sin. So sin is the killer. Sin is the very thing that we need to be saved from. And, and of course, as I said before, one of the function of the Spirit of God is to convict us of sin. Convict us of sin. Not downplaying sin. 
but seeing it for uh, what it is. We are sinful, wretched, wicked people. And the, and the average man on the street doesn't believe that he is wicked. They honestly believe that they are good people. Now, we might be, you know, doing good from time to time, but that doesn't make us good people. We are sinful people that do good from time to time. We are not good people that do, you know, bad things from time to time. Our nature is corrupted. That's why we need to be saved and given a new nature. That's why we need to be changed. And so that way when we walk in the Spirit of God, people can see Christ in us. And this is why outside of Jesus Christ, no way in the world we can ever be redeemed and, 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 and rescued and saved. <clears throat> and so we need to see ourselves sinful. When a person sees their need for a saviour, then they call on him by faith, and that's important to understand as well. That we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. And we're not saved by a little prayer that perhaps we said one time. The prayer in itself does not save. It's faith in the substance of our prayer, Jesus Christ. A lot of people focus more on their prayer and on themselves and on their condition and on their posture more than the substance. A lot of people can say a prayer but not understand that Christ is the one that is able to save them. And it becomes, you know, like a you know, confession box. You know, as a Catholic, I went to a priest and confessed my sins every week. And the problem is, is because I was confessing it to the wrong person. I know I could tell people where I've gone wrong, but they can't save me, only Jesus can. And I have to believe that he's able to save me and that he's the one that died for me. And God sent his son, motivated by his grace, and by faith I receive him. As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. You know, uh, being in church can't save a person. I mean, you can come to church every day, every week, every month, every year, but that's not going to save you. Is being in church good? Yes, it is good. We get to praise God for what he's done for us. We get to hear God's word. We get to fellowship around the things of God, but that's not going to save us. Not by works, uh, not by the law, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy, the Bible says, saved us. So a person is saved by putting their full trust and complete trust in the work of Jesus Christ, the finished work. On that cross, he hung his head and said, it's finished, it's done, it's paid in full. What was paid in full? Our sin, by his blood, our, he, he atoned for it. And so salvation is by God's grace. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, boast and it's through faith. And 1 Peter 5 says, we are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation. And so it's by faith alone. It's by Jesus Christ alone. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, neither is there any salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Bible says and makes it very clear that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way that you and I can have forgiveness is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so forgiveness is a byproduct of salvation. When we're saved, when we call upon the Lord to be saved from our sin, and we humble ourselves and we say, have mercy upon me, a sinner, and God saves me, then he forgives my sin. Listen, past, present, and future. He forgives me, a sinner. He saves me, a sinner. And that's important to understand. And your life after that becomes a series of repentance. You're not repenting for salvation, but rather you are repenting or confessing that you may continue to be made in the image of God. And can I say there's another component that's very important when you get saved? It's called the joy of the Lord. You have this peace and you have this joy that comes, and if you do sin, by the way, that's what you lose. You don't lose your salvation when you're saved, but you lose your joy. You, leave, you, you, you lose that peace that you had in your heart. Okay? The Spirit of God is grieved. So if God in you is saddened when you sin as a Christian, that means that joy is suppressed that you're supposed to have that comes from the Spirit of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, and joy. In the Holy Ghost. So we've got to understand when you're saved that naturally uh, there's joy. All right? And uh, 
and by the way, there's joy all around when Jesus gave that parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. He was trying to, you know, really expound through those parables that there's joy in heaven when one sinner comes to repentance. And you know what? We, all, we sometimes get that, you know, a bit wrong and confused. A lot of people say, well, the angels are rejoicing in heaven. Well, the Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. So who's rejoicing? God the Father. Like the prodigal son came back to the father. He's the one that initiated the great feast. Amen. That his other brother couldn't understand. So God is the one that's causing the rejoicing to take place. A sinner has been saved. Someone's come home. He once was blind, but now he sees. He once was lost, but now he's found. And so they've got, there has to be joy. I mean, how could heaven rejoice and you remain, you know, just sad? <laughs> so when you get saved, I don't know if that happened to you, but I was rejoicing. Now, some people get saved, and it's a long time for them, and perhaps they're young, and they can't understand the situation. Or, you know, and I get that. I, I understand memory lapse. But do you have the joy of the Lord now? Are you rejoicing in God, your Savior, when you think about Him? Because you've got to have the joy of the Lord sometime. It's got to begin when you were saved, but did you, did you have the joy of the Lord? Because Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the water of life. He quenches that thirst. He's the one that satisfies that hunger. You know, those times that we were depressed and we're down and we, we're out. Jesus fills the gap. He's the one that's supposed to do what no man can do. No, no drug prescription can do. No alcohol can do. No person can do. Jesus Christ does that. There's joy in the Lord. There's peace in God. Jesus says, I came to give peace, but not like the world giveth. When Jesus gives peace, he gives it. You know what? You can have the peace of God on your deathbed. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. There's no greater joy to know that when you're dying, he's with you. <laughs> no matter where I go, he's with me. He's my heavenly father. He's my Abba. Father, Albert, Bar Albert Barnes said, it was joy resulting from the fact that he was reconciled to God. What an what a amazing thought that is, that we were once enmity with God, but because of Jesus Christ, we've been made, you know, we've been made right. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ, therefore we're reconciled to God the Father. We're friends of God. We're not enemies, but we're friends. We're on the right side of God. I, I, that just brings comfort. And, uh, and we're not against God. God's not against us. If God be for us, who could be against us? All those truths in Romans 8. Who can separate us from the love of God? All that joy and peace that comes from the Holy Ghost when you're saved, that must be there. And the peace and joy that I'm free. I'm no longer a slave to my sin or my habitual bad habits god is freeing me i look back and i'm not the same man that i was 18 years ago and i sure don't want to be the same person i am 18 years from now i want god to continue to do that work and i know he will he that began the good work in you will finish it until the day of jesus christ what a work that is it's a wonderful thing to be saved by the blood of the lamb and there, there must be no doubt a genuine heart to follow christ this is what repentance is all about. This is the call of the sinner. A genuine heart to follow Jesus Christ must be there. You know, motive plays a big part in why we do what we do. A big part. Plays a big part. Can I say this to you? Why did you call on the Lord? Was your salvation circumstantial? Salvation? You know, some people have circumstantial salvation. I go out on the street and I understand and I don't, you know, I do not for, for, for a second expect non-believers to understand Bible term terminologies. Or those that are not really saved or inundated with the Bible. Don't, I, I get it, but I say it so that way they can ask me, what do you mean by that? And I can explain to them the gospel. When I say, are you saved? So yeah, I've been saved. And they tell me about how they got saved from a car wreck. Well, God did this and did that and all the rest of it. And then I use that and say, well, you know what? It could be that God preserved you and that you're not dead to hear the gospel today. Because had you died without Christ back then, you would have been finished. 
And so circumstantial salvation is not salvation. But not only that, some people want God to save them from what their sin problem, you know, caused them. You know, the thief on the cross is a good example. Go to Luke 23. I want you to see this. <clears throat> there were two thieves on the cross that day. They were, by the way, being executed. Who can remember their crime? I mean, the title of their name gives it away. They were what? Thieves. Even back then, it was cap capital punishment. It was a serious crime. And they were being executed. And the Bible says in verse 39, one of the male factors or the criminals which were hung railed on him. They railed on him. Saying, if thou be the uh, Christ, save us, save thyself and us. Hey, if you really say you're the Christ, you can save us. So did they believe that Jesus can save? Yes. They knew that he had the power to get off that cross and even get them off. But circumstantial salvation. Is that true salvation if God gets you out of a predicament? Or if God somehow gets you from a situation that you put yourself in? It'll be a blessing. It'll be a, some sort of uh, you know, grace. But that's not true salvation, is it? Save us. He says, save us, save us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Look at this. He says, We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. You know what he's saying? Don't you fear God? He rebuked him, even on his deathbed. He rebuked him. He says, Don't you fear God? We deserve what we get. We are... We are being, we're getting justice here. We're thieves and we're paying the price. But this man had done nothing amiss. Realized that Jesus Christ was the Holy One of God and they realized, he realized that day that he was a sinner and he was worthy of death. And he looked at Jesus and he said these words. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And you know what Jesus said to him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Someone wanted to pick up something today from the house. Um, a marketplace came right here. It was an SDA and he said, you know what? That, uh, we use that passage. And somehow that passage came, came up and we were talking about it. And he said, you know what Jesus said to him? Because I don't believe they believe in hell. He says, oh, Jesus was just all heaven in that respect. He says um, that Jesus was talking about that today I tell you, you'll be in paradise. So you're not going to be with me in paradise today, but today I tell you, you're going to be with me in paradise. So what, when's that going to happen? So grammatically it's not right. Jesus said, today you'll be with me. That's how it reads. But let's just say you read it the other, the, the other way. Today I tell you, you'll be with me. When is that day? Either way, he's going to be with the Lord in heaven. Amen. Either way, he's going to be where Jesus is. But that's, the verse is really saying that today you'll be with me in paradise. It says what it says. And, and, and who did he say it to? To the other thief that was complaining and wanted circumstantial salvation? No. The one that could actually admit his sin and realize that he deserved death. You know, some people don't even think that they deserve death. They deserve to live. But you cannot in any way, shape or form get saved if you don't realize that you deserve what you get for the sin you have committed you if you don't come to that point say lord i am not worthy i am not worthy that's what the thief of the cross is really saying that's what the prodigal son was saying i'm not worthy to be called your son make me a hired servant why because he saw his sin he saw how he spat in his father's face and rebelled against his father and spent his money on righteous living and ended up in the pig pen and finally had the humility to say, I have sinned against heaven and against my father. And a person who fails to see this sin and just calls on the Lord because they don't want to end up in hell also need to examine themselves. You, know, you go out on the street and the person with their right mind wouldn't want to go to hell. You get some people, they might say, yeah, I want to go to hell. 
you know, they're an exception, but a person in their right mind wouldn't want to, who wants to go to hell? I mean, you know, I had this young kid just recently, not young, maybe about 17 years old. I said, you really don't want to go to hell. I said, have you ever tried grabbing a lighter and putting it on your hand? For, just do it for 10 seconds. Sure enough, he got himself a lighter. All his friends were there. Pride kicked in and he held it for 10 seconds. He, he didn't move. Looked like that. It was black. Charcoal. We're talking about it the other day. Every time he looks at that hand, he's going to remember. He's going to remember. You don't want to go to hell. But, you know, salvation is not just about escaping the fires of hell. Can I just say this to you? Salvation is more than that. You are reconciled to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Do you understand that salvation is coming back in a right relationship with God? Because sin separates us from God. Jesus came to save sinners from their sin. And not only what sin causes, not only the surface stuff, but the root problem. And the root problem is our wicked heart. Jeremiah said it clearly. The heart is deceitful. Above all things, and desperately wicked, desperately wicked, who could know it? Well, God does. God knows it. And that's why it's a good thing to come to the Lord and ask the Lord to not only save us, but change his heart, that we'll have a heart that's for him. Second mark I want to talk about is this. The second mark, the first mark is true, you know, repentance or true call of the sinner. The second one is a changed life. When you call on the Lord and you get saved, you profess to be saved, there must be a change in your life. There must be. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That's positionally. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. But if Christ comes in and starts the renovation, things must change. Certain things must take place. So there are several terminology the Bible uses in the changed life. Number one is a new creature. This is what we see in 2 um, Corinthians 5.17. Any man being Christ, he's a new creature. But I want you to turn to Galatians 6. <clears throat> I want you to see something in Galatians 6. New creature is defined as a new person. And look at verse 14. The Bible says, God for, But God forbid that I should glory, save or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I've got something to glory in, it's glorying in the Lord, in the cross, in the work of Christ. Amen. By whom the, the world is crucified unto me and I on the world. I'm dead to the world and the world is dead to me. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, or what? Uncircumcision, but a what? New creature. So it's not the outward, you know, uh, uh, ritual, custom, tradition. You know, all these things might be good, but they cannot be evidence of a new creature. People can get circumcised, baptized, go to church, all this, do ritual, custom things. But these things are not evidence of salvation. So many people are religious people, but they're not saved people. They're not born again, and this is another terminology that we use. But before I get to that terminology, the Bible speaks about uh, being regenerated. Okay? Be regenerated. It's found in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. But after that, the kindness of, and the love of God our Saviour toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So regeneration simply means to be bathed all over, to be washed, uh, to be uh, you know, cleansed, to be regenerated also means uh, to be made new. Uh, to, 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 to be renovated, a renovation takes place. And the Holy Spirit is the very one that does that, regenerates us. Uh, uh, John Phillips said, in, in God's sight, we are so vile that a complete bathe is required. The washing of regeneration, the agent of that cleansing is the blood of Christ. Uh, uh, once the washing has taken place, he says, 
the regeneration by the Spirit can take place. Spurgeon says, a supernatural work of the Holy Ghost must be wrought in every one of us if we would see the face of God with acceptance. There has to be a work of God through the Holy Ghost in our lives to cause this born-again experience. This is known as the second birth, the spiritual birth. Uh, we all have a, you know, been born into the world the first time, but we must be born again. That means born a second time, and it's a spiritual birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see or enter in the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel, Nicodemus. You must be born again. In other words, you were born from flesh. Now you need to be born of the spirit. You need to be born of God. And how are you born of God? Well, he says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. And those that look will live. Those that look or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart will be saved. The Holy Spirit of God will enter in and he will start to regenerate, make you a child of God instantly, positionally. But that's what you, you become. New person, regenerated, child of God, and then things must change from there on. You must grow. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. There's got to be a growing process for something. Old things not, must pass away. New things must come in. The old man must be crucified. The new man must be, be put on. Amen? And so there must be that change. Man of God once said, do not, uh, you do not manufacture Christians any more than you manufacture babies. The only way to enter into God's family is through the new birth. Someone once approached George Whitfield and he says, why do you always preach that you must be born again? And he, sim and he simply said, because you must be born again. You must be born again. Your profession is not good enough. There must be a change in your life. Did you know that there was a foretelling of this change in the Old Testament? This wasn't foreign in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you, don't, you a ruler of the Jews, you don't know what this means? To be born again? I mean, it was prophesied that God was going to give you a new heart. It was prophesied under the new covenant that the Messiah was going to come and he will put his spirit in you. And that you'd walk in God's ways and it'll cause you to walk in God's ways. It's a miracle birth. It just takes place. You see the life that takes place and you look back and you think, what a work of God. You should be my people. And I'll put a new heart in you and you'll walk in my ways. God does amazing work at that point of salvation and onwards. And so we see the Lord gives that command in Deuteronomy 10 verse 16. He says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. And be no more stiff-necked. Even back in the Old Testament when they had those you know, laws and, 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 and regulations and so forth, God still wanted the approach to be right. And he wanted their heart to be right with God. You can, force, you can, you can circumcise outwardly and do all the Christian things or even all the Jewish things outwardly, but if your heart is not right with God, then it's all for nothing. Outward circumcision is something man can do, but inward circumcision is something God does. The reality is, if God is not doing a work in you, then you're not saved. It's got to be a work of God done in your life. Amen. And the Lord declares the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, 30, uh, 33. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write them on, on their hearts. And I will be their God and that shall be my people. And of course, that new covenant was fulfilled by Christ through his blood. And uh, in the Lord confirms the new heart in Ezekiel 11 verse 19. He says, I will give them one heart and I will, I will put a new spirit within you and I will take this stony heart out of their flesh and I will, I, will, I will give them a heart of flesh. You know, God never desired outward conformity. He always wanted a person to be simply transformed by God through faith in his son. Now, I want you to see the foundation of the changed life. The new birth is the renewing of the whole soul of a person in righteousness and in true holiness. You know, heaven is a place of holiness. It's a place where God resides. It's not tainted. 
Uh, and the only time that we can actually enter in is when we're made perfect and pure in Christ. No real change can ever take place unless we have Christ in us. Uh, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We must be in Christ. So I want you to see the foundation of a changed life. First of all, let me point out to you that the Pharisees had a wrong foundation. Um, Jesus said, go to Matthew 5. I want you to see something here, what Jesus said on Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, he says, I for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he says this, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Wow. Jesus makes it clear that the religious rulers displayed some sort of righteousness. Right? The scribes were doctors of the law. They, would, they were responsible for you know, writing the law, the scriptures, carefully. The Pharisees were the one to execute and be an example of how that looked like and lived out. And we see that you know, the statement by Jesus would have no doubt uh, grabbed the attention of the common man, the common people, because they looked at the Pharisees at the example and thought, how are we going to exceed that? But at the same time, it would have been you know, a, a blow to the Pharisees because they thought, oh, what, we're not good enough perhaps? Exceed our righteousness? Like, aren't we you know, that pure? No, Christ is. And so the question has to be asked, why was the righteousness of the religious rulers, why wasn't it good enough? Because he says, it's got to exceed that. I mean, that righteousness is just... <laughs> It's got to exceed that. So why wasn't it good enough? Well, number one, the righteousness of the Pharisees, these scribes, they based it on the wrong foundation. Go to Romans 10. I want you to see something there. The Pharisees justified themselves on the basis of what they did and didn't do. In other words, they justified themselves by their works. Not a new heart, not a new creature, but by, by their religious activity. Okay, notice in Romans 10 verse 1, brethren, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So he says, I'll bear record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Who, okay, what's the righteousness of God? Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So these religious rulers are what we call today legalist. Legalist is one who tries to earn or attain salvation by their own merit. <clears throat> and so, second, they had the wrong motives. Some of these religious rulers practiced, um, you know, their religious uh, rituals for the wrong reasons. In Matthew chapter 23, 28, Jesus says, Even so, also outwardly ye appear righteous unto men, but within, you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You know, they did certain things to justify themselves before men. They wanted to look righteous, not be righteous. Luke 16, 15, Jesus said unto them, Ye are that which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is ab abomination in the sight of God. Not only the wrong motives, they had the wrong priorities. Matthew 23, 25, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, ye hypocrites. He says, For you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. So from the outside, they looked pretty good, but the inside was terrible. Now, he's not condemning the outside, but they just had the wrong priorities. Get the heart right first and get the outward. If you, all you do is have outward show, that's just what it is. It's, it's human righteousness displayed for everybody to see for you to get the glory Matthew 23 26 he says thou blind Pharisees clean first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean also now quickly I'm running out of time I've only got about eight minutes left I want to just close with saying that a person <clears throat> that has this new life in Christ must demonstrate the fruits of true righteousness and we find that in the book of John. Go to 1 John. Not the Gospel of John, the letter of John before Revelation in Jude. John the Baptist said very clearly, Bring forth therefore fruits 
worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up the children of Abraham. You know, God can make descendants of Abraham if he wanted to, like that. Not only just turning, you know, bread from stone, but he can actually turn people from stone. Yeah, God made Adam from the dust of the word and breathed in it, life in him. Yeah, God can make robots, but he doesn't want people just to, you know, be conformed in, in, that, in that way. He wants people to have a heart for God and see who God is and understand that they're sinners and they repent and turn to God with their whole heart. God is looking for someone that will turn to him with their whole heart. He's looking for seekers that will be genuine and have genuine fruits of repentance. People brought up doing what their tradition expects them to do is not what makes a person new. My children can be brought up in the Christian home. We have devo devotions in the morning. We read the Bible. We pray. We sing. But that's not, uh, they're not going to grow up depending upon that. These are good things that we do. They have to come to the point of their life that they must repent and turn to Christ. And God, by the Holy Spirit, begins to work in them fruits of righteousness by the Spirit of God. How does that look like? Look at 1 John chapter 2. When a person has new life in Christ, there is adamant new you know, growth uh, in their life. And there's, these are new desires. They, they, these are growing desires. You might have these desires in your life, but they grow. Uh, they, they intensify, I should say, as you walk in the ways of God. Look at verse 2. You have a growing love for God's word. Before you were saved, I don't believe we had this growing love and desire for God's word. But when you're saved and you have the Spirit of God in you, there has to be this growing desire for the Word of God. Look at verse 2. And he is a propitiation, talking about Christ, for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him. How do we know that we know him? This is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a what? Is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily the love of God is perfected, and he by uh, know we that we know him. We cannot be indifferent about the word of God. The word of God is not grievous to us. It shouldn't be grievous to us. It should be a delight to do. Do I struggle in doing it? Yes. Are they real? Yes. Uh, being a backslider, is that real? Yes, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about having this fruit, this desire for the word of God that an that a, that a unsaved man doesn't have. They have religion, they have some ritual things, you know, that, that, that there's no strong desire that God gives in the person to continue uh, to follow after the, the commandments of God. Do you have a desire for the word of God to do them? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Salvation ought to bring about a love for God and his word. Number two, there ought to be a growing hatred for sin. Okay, have a look at uh, uh, 1 John 3, verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, he cannot sin. Why? Because he's born of God. He's saying, what, we're never going to sin? Well, he doesn't commit sin, doesn't want to live in sin, doesn't want to continue in sin. That's the new person. The old man is a slave to sin. There's no ability to say no to sin and submit himself to the Spirit's leading. The Bible says if the Spirit of God is not in you, it doesn't lead you, you're not, you don't belong to him. And the Spirit of God, that seed that remains in us, leads us out of corruption and leads us into sanctification. There has to be a, you know, this uh, new life that we have out of sin. We don't continue in sin. We get out of sin. Can you fall into sin? Yes. If we sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our, of our sins and cleanse us from all what? Unright if we what? Confess it. But we don't do what we used to do and, you know, just continue in it and flaunt and just, you know, have a good old time, no conviction. No, there's, there's, a, there's a great change towards sin. We hate it and we confess it and we want to forsake it. There ought to be a growing love for God's people. Have a look at uh, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life 
because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in what? Death. Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderers have eternal life abideth in him. And one of the keys to loving your brother is having forbearance and love for that person. In what? Forgiving. If you are going to hold grudges against people and not forgive them and not pray for them and uh, you rather them die and you rather this happen to them, there's something wrong with your heart. There's something terribly wrong. First, first John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. You don't want to see your brother's destruction. You want to see your brother's recovery and restoration. You don't want to curse him. You want to bless him. And so there's a, you know, do you struggle with forgiveness? Yes. But you're not going to simply have that grudge in your heart for so long if you're walking with God. How can you say that you love God and you don't love your brother? It's warped. It's not, it doesn't match. Because God is what? Love. And he gives you that love to love even your enemies. How can you have that love to love your enemies? Your own enemies. People that literally stab you. Not just spiritually stab you in the back, but literally stab you. How do you pray for these people? How do you pray for their salvation? How do you pray for their restoration? Well, the Spirit of God in you. Like Jesus hung on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. When Stephen was getting stoned, he says, lay this not on their charge. How do you say, how do you even utter those words? Well, the Spirit of God has to be in you. You know, you see in a lot of people their family members mistreated and they want justice and they go to court. Okay? There's nothing wrong with justice. The problem is, is uh, I'll never forgive them. I hope they rot in hell. That's, you might want justice and say, that a man be judged according to his deeds. That might help that person recover, but you don't want them to have this vengeance spirit attitude, this condemnation, in your heart. Okay, so how can you say that you're a Christian when you hate your brother? Spurgeon said, uh, this is regarding the next one, a growing separation from the world. Spurgeon said, sanctification is the great open separator of Christians from the world. 1 John 5 verse 4, Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So there needs to be this separation between the Christian and the world. I'll give you another one. Time is ticking. A growing love for the Lord. Look at 1 John 5 and verse 1 to 3. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Everyone that loveth him, that begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Just, it's repetitive. When we say to Christians that have professed Christ to be their saviour, the first thing that we might encourage them to do is read the gospel of John and then go all the way to the epistles of John. Because that's, that's a good place to start. A good mirror to look into to see whether or not my profession is that of God or it's true, or it's genuine. And then we see, as I close, just a couple of more verses, the faithfulness of a changed life. In other words, listen to me very carefully. It, 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 this is not, uh, you know, a little, how can I say this, phase that you're going to. This is not AA meeting, 10 steps of how to recover from alcoholism. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go back to the booze. Christianity is not like that. It's, a, it's, a, it's a being faithful to the Lord to continue to grow you. Amen? You know, the evidence of a professing believer is becoming a new person in Christ and to have a continued, renewed walk. So even if you're backsliding, according to Hebrews, my Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth. And scourgeth everyone whom he receiveth. If you be without chastening, ye are bastards and not children. In other words, you're illegitimate children. If you go off the rails as a Christian, 
It's God, the Father's responsibility to bring you back into the fold, to get you back on track. And His heavy hand of love will do that. And praise God for His heavy hand of love. Amen. He's firm with us, but He's loving. Colossians 2, 6. As ye therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, the Bible says, so walk ye in Him. If you have the Spirit, the Bible says, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. And Jesus said to His disciples, or to those Jews, I should say, He said to those Jews which believed on Him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. So continuing as a Christian is one of the marks of your salvation. It's not a phase that you're going through. It's not you're trying Christianity and never worked. No, you continue to love the Lord and seek God. You're going to stumble. You're going to fall. Just man falls seven times, gets up again. By God's grace and he goes. And he does the, and he does the very things. Uh, that God has called him to do. The will of God is fulfilled in his life. A genuine believer holds fast and obeys the things that he's taught. They follow through. Uh, they, he allows the word of God to sanctify them. 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 9 to 10 the Bible says here. <clears throat> know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God? Who's the unrighteous? Be not deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, feminine, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, extortioners. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. And he says in verse 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. Albert Barnes says, as every man is a sinner, it is necessary that each one should experience this change. Or he cannot be happy or saved. A new life takes place and this continued life takes place. Salvation is God turning bad people into good and godly people and transform, transforms people that are slaves to sin into sons of God. Amen? Let's pray.